Hey folks, this is Blair Fix. I'm going to be talking to you today about redistributing income through hierarchy and a bit of a backstory to this talk. It was supposed to happen on Zoom today, but we got Zoom bombed. Uh, so I consider that a little bit of a badge of honor that I've perturbed people. Uh, my research has perturbed people enough that they would Zoom bomb my talk. Anyway, I got the talk ready to go, uh, so I figured why not record it and throw it up on YouTube and uh, let people watch it. Uh, so this talk is about income, the growth of inequality, and how that relates to, uh, to hierarchy. So let's start off with some uh, words, wise words from John Maynard Keynes in 1933. Keynes says, it is not intelligent, it is not beautiful, it is not just, it is not virtuous, and it doesn't deliver the goods. In short, we dislike it, and we are beginning to despise it. But when we wonder what to put in its place, we are extremely perplexed. And of course, Keynes was talking about uh, capitalism at the time, and we could say the same thing about capitalism today. Uh, but we could also say the same thing about the distribution of income. It's certainly not virtuous uh, when we've got homeless people uh, living beside enormous mansions. I don't think anybody thinks that is virtuous and it doesn't deliver the goods. Uh, both in a um, material sense in that there, there's vast material inequality, but also in, um, in the sense of ideas. Our theory of income distribution, our, the mainstream theory of income distribution, certainly does not deliver the goods. So what is this theory? Well, uh, it date back, dates back to the work of this guy, John Bates Clark, who was a neoclassical economist who in 1899 wrote a book called the distribution of wealth. And in that book, uh, Bates argued that in a competitive market, everybody earns back what they put in. They earn what they produce. And this is called the theory of marginal productivity. And I think it's a terrible scientific theory, uh, but it's a great ideology. Basically, it says everybody deserves what they earn. Uh, so if you're very poor, you deserve to be poor because you're not productive. And if you're very rich, you deserve to be rich because you're not productive. Uh, so this is great ideology, terrible science, uh, but it's still what we have in the mainstream of economics. So um, clearly, I think, and many heterodox economists think we should get rid of this theory. But then the question is, what should we put in its place? And, and there, well, unfortunately, we are extremely perplexed. And the problem is that uh, the causes of income are complex. Um, it's easy to see that marginal productivity is a simple theory that is wrong. It's not easy to see how we could replace that theory with another simple theory that is correct. Um, the reality, if you just look at the world, is that the causes of income are ridiculously complex, and we should admit that for sure. Uh, Here's a handful of things that affect income. Ideology, for sure, and politics, which are kind of the same thing as ideology, but perhaps just an extension or manifestation of it. Uh, class struggle, the famous thing that Marx focused on, and power, of course. And these are just the, some things off the top of my head. The point is that um, income, the causes of individual income, are very complex, and we shouldn't kid ourselves. We don't really understand it very well. Uh, that said, the outcome is surprisingly simple. And what I mean by that is when we kind of abstract from individuals and look at the entire distribution of income, it has a very simple pattern that seems to happen over and over and over in all, uh, in many, many countries and over time, too. And what, so what is this pattern? Well, top incomes tend to follow a power law distribution. And if you don't know what a power law distribution is, don't worry. I'm going to uh, cover it shortly. 
But just know that um, this is a pattern basically that we find among the rich and it's a, it's a pattern that pops up again and again and again. Uh, so there's uniformity to the way incomes are distributed and that's kind of surprising. Uh, and then income redistribution corresponds to a shift in the power law exponent. And again, don't worry about what this means uh, in a technical sense, but just know that um, what happens when inequality, inequality grows is there's this very simple trend in the way income gets redistributed. It's very easy to model. And so that's kind of interesting given how complicated individual income is. So these things I think need a explanation. If the causes of income are complex, why is the outcome so simple? And I'm going to argue because of hierarchy. This is a hypothesis. And what I'm going to argue is that hierarchy is approximate cause of inequality. So what I mean by approximate cause is that I'm not going to try to explain the ultimate cause of inequality in one go. I'm going to try to uh, put hierarchy in the middle and then leave a lot of questions unanswered. So here's what I mean. Uh, start with some um, things like ideology and politics and class struggle, things that we think are maybe the ultimate causes of inequality, but we don't really understand them very well. I'm going to propose that they get filtered through the, the structure of hierarchy. So by hierarchy, I mean a chain of command. So within a, a company, within a government, a hierarchical chain of command. And these chains of command have a very uh, regular um, structure, right? There's a nested structure. Each superior controls a few subordinates. That gives hierarchy a very ordered um, pattern. And then at the same time, as we move up a hierarchy, income increases. And it's not necessarily the same in every hierarchy, but in every hierarchy that we look, there is some increase in income with rank. So it turns out that if you assume that hierarchy behaves this way, and I'll show you how it works, we get out the other end a power law distribution of top incomes. So what I, and I think this is very useful then for studying the distribution of income, but because it, it tells us how we can get from really messy, complex causes to a very simple outcome, because there's this proximate cause of hierarchy. Uh, so with that in mind, here's the road ahead. Uh, I'm going to first talk about trends in inequality. I'll show you some trends that you've probably seen, and then I'll show you ways of visualizing income distributions uh, in a way that you maybe haven't seen. Uh, then I'm going to talk about hierarchy and income within hierarchies. Uh, and I'm going to kind of formalize what we see in the data into a model. And then I'm going to use this model to understand, try to understand how we redistribute income through hierarchy. So let's talk about trends in inequality. And to jump into it, let's uh, hear what Thomas Piketty has to say about it. So this is a quote from his best-selling book, Capital, in the 21st century. He says, intellectual and political debate about the distribution of wealth has long been based on an abundance of prejudice and a paucity of fact. Now, that was certainly the case, um, well, it certainly still is the case in political discussions, unfortunately, in the mainstream, uh, but it's not the case in the technical literature on inequality we have now more evidence than at any uh, time in human history, and that's thanks in large part to Piketty. Um, so I'm going to show you some data now from Thomas Piketty. This is, uh, I'm going to show you trends in U.S. income inequality. I'm going to show you the top 1% income share over the last century, and this is a very famous chart. It looks like this. It's a, a U-shaped trend. So in the uh, 20s and the 30s, there was a, a gilded era with extreme inequality, and that, that um, gave way to the 50s and the 60s, 70s even, where there was um, quite minimal inequality in the United States. And then, um, for some reason, in the 80s, 90s, 2000s, we started 
cre uh, creeping back up to a higher inequality. And now we live, or at least Americans live, in a new gilded era with very extreme inequality. So this is a very famous chart. Many of you have probably seen it. And uh, so a lot of people take these inequality trends and then jump right into trying to explain the inequality causes. Now, I understand this, uh, wanting to do this, and in fact, I've done it myself, but there, there is more to the distribution of income than just top income shares. So wait, there's more. And I'm gonna show you the more, but it's a bit technical, which is why uh, fewer people do it. So uh, I'm gonna show you how it works, but before we get to the data, we're gonna have to do a little crash course on visualizing uh, distributions and here distributions of income. So let's jump into this little crash course. Everything about distributions starts with uh, the histogram. You can visualize any data, any distribution of data with a histogram, uh, so you can do it with income too. So let's see how it works. Uh, and we'll use height, human height as an example. So suppose we have uh, people of different heights and uh, some people are short, some people are medium height, some people are tall. And what we're gonna do to make a histogram is just lump people into size height bins and then and the, the bins are arbitrary. Uh, but then we're just gonna start counting how many people are each in each size bin. So suppose we have 10 uh, short people, 15 medium sized people and eight tall people um, th those are our frequency counts, and then we just plot uh, bars, and there we have our histogram. Uh, so this is a way of visualizing the data, um, a distribution of data. Uh, so this is made up uh, data, a made up distribution of heights, but we can do the same thing with real data. So let's look at Americans. Uh, so we'll look at the height of Americans, and so on the horizontal axis here we have height, and I've measured in centimeters, and I have marked here these little um, gray line segments. Those are the bins, the uh, height bins that we're going to lump people into. Uh, and we're just gonna count them up. So I've downloaded a big data set of American heights, and when we count heights, uh, it looks like this. We get a nice uh, bell curve, which is a very common shape in uh, for statistical distributions. And uh, so most people, the most likely height is right around 170 centimeters, and that happens to be the median height. So a median is just the middle of the data. 50% of people are below the median, and 50% of people are above the median. Uh, so this is a nice pretty bell curve, which we expect from height. Uh, so this is not the only way of representing a histogram, though. Another way to do it is to join the um, data points. So instead of using bars here, we'll put a point at the midpoint of each um, uh, column and then join them up. And sometimes this is called a frequency histogram, but I'm just going to call it a histogram. Or not a frequency histogram, sorry, a frequency polygon. But I'm going to call it a histogram because uh, it shows the same information. Now, we can take this technique and apply it to any data, and we can apply it to income, which I will do now. Uh, so now we have the same thing on the bottom, on the X axis, we have income in thousands of dollars, and we've got our little bins here, and I think each bin is about $2,000. So we're just gonna count people in each bin. So let's do that. I'm going to use simulated data, um, but it's representative or indicative of what real data would look like. Uh, so we might get something like this. So you, right away you can see that this is not a normal distribution. It's, it's skewed to the right. Um, here's where the median income is. So it's $30,000. I've defined it to be that. Uh, and yet the peak, the most probable income is below that. And then way over here, we have the skew where some people earn a lot of money. Um, 
So the problem with looking at income distributions this way is that uh, the rich are off the chart. So, and I'm interested in the rich. So this is a problem. If we wanna see what's going on with the very rich, we need a way of making them on the chart. And we can't do that really when we're, we're plotting a linear scale. So what's the solution? The solution is to use a logarithmic histogram. So logs, logarithms, um, are a great way to show uh, numbers that vary over an enormous range. So in a logarithmic scale, we go up by powers of 10, say. So instead of going 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, we'd go 10 to the 1, which is 10. 10, and 100, 1,000, 10,000, we go up by powers of 10. So we'll apply that to our histogram. So things start out looking the same here. Now we've got income on the horizontal axis and the number of people on the vertical axis. And again, bins. But notice now that we've got powers of 10. So 10 to the 3, that's 1,000. 10 to the 4, 10,000. 100,000, uh, 100, million, uh, 10 million, and so on. So we're going up by powers of 10. So we can see now the whole scale of the distribution of income. And then on the vertical scale, that's also a log scale. Uh, so now we're counting people the number of people in each bin in terms of powers of 10. Uh, so the resulting histogram is going to look very different. It looks like this. Um, for reference, here's the median income. So most people earn close to the median income. You can tell that because there's a peak up here. But then we have this long, long right tail into deceptively large incomes, right? Some people over here are earning tens of millions of dollars. Uh, Another point of reference, this is the threshold for the top 1% income share. Um, so the, all, all the people over here on the right side of the plot are the rich. Um, another feature of, of plotting histograms this way is that you can see the power law tail. Uh, and that shows up in a log-log histogram uh, as a straight line. So when you see it, this roughly long straight line here, that's a pretty good sign that you're dealing with the power law. And we'll talk about the mathematics in, uh, shortly, uh, but I want you to just tell you how it looks visually. Now there's one last step. If we're going to um, compare distributions, uh, there's one more technical trick, which is to normalize the histogram. And all that means is that we, we change the, the scales of the axes so that you can compare different data types. So for income, that means we don't plot dollar values on the horizontal axis because those change over time like um, we have inflation and we have economic growth, which means you couldn't necessarily plot the distribution of income for different years uh, without normalizing it. So what I do here is plot everything relative to the median income. So I define the median to be one and then measure all the incomes relative to it. So some people over here are earning 10,000 times the median income. And then we normalize the vertical scale by plotting not the raw counts, but a density. And all the density means is that we define the area under this curve to be one. And I'm not gonna go through how we do that. Uh, but nothing change, changes about the shape of this curve. Uh, all that changes are the axes. But when you have this normalized um, histogram, you can compare any sets of data. And so let's do that now. Uh, let's look at income redistribution in the United States. Um, just to revisit, here's the very famous trend from Thomas Piketty. Um, and what I wanna do is look at, at two years, 1970 and 2007, and in these two years I'm gonna look at the entire distribution of income to see how it's changed. And these two years kind of represent the minimum in 1970 of inequality and then the modern maximum in 2007. Uh, so we're gonna plot the histogram, the log histogram for these years. So we'll start with our familiar um, log histogram scale, so we've got income relative to the median on the horizontal axis, and uh, income density, which is just counting 
the number of people on the vertical axis. So here's the data in 1970. Uh, you can see that most people earn close to the median income, which is defined to be one again. And then there's this long right tail. Uh, <clears throat> so that's 1970. What does it look like in 2007? Well, it looks like this. Um, there are clear differences, but before we get to the differences, let's talk about the similarities. So we have all this overlap on close to the median income. The, the two lines overlap, which tells us that basically at that level of income, close to the median, nothing has really changed between 1970 and 2007 in relative terms. Instead, what has changed are the extremes, the extremes of high income and the extremes of low income. At the low end, we have creeping poverty. So just to rewind here, in 1970, at least according to the data that we have, nobody really earned less than 1% uh, of the median. Whereas in um, 2007, there was this creep towards extremely low incomes. And so this is important to study. It's like the poor getting poorer, uh, but it's not the topic that I want to discuss here. Instead, I'm, I'm going to focus on the rich over here. So this is the rich getting richer. And it, this is what it looks like when we plot it on a log histogram. It looks like a change in the slope. It's a very simple, uh, this deceptively simple change given how messy like the political reality of this um, income redistribution is. And so that deserves an explanation. Why is there, is the, all the, is the rich getting richer? Why does it basically just shift the slope of the distribution tail? And one last thing, again, we see a power law tail. And that's evident as these long um, straight lines in the slope of the distribution. So we want to explain this. So we have this simple outcome. To a first approximation, top incomes are distributed according to a power law. Uh, and when inequality grows, the power law shifts. Okay, so this, uh, we need to answer this question. Now, what is a power law? Let's get into the mathematics right now. Well, we'll start with a very simple example. Uh, Newton's law of gravity happens to be a power law. Maybe you learned it in high school, but the force between two masses is uh, inver inversely proportional to the square of the distance, which we call r. This is a power law. So we have the variable r raised to some power two. So it's a very simple equation, and then two is our power. Uh, it's a very simple equation. And that's one of the things that are so interesting about power laws is that they are mathematically simple. The same thing, we can apply the same principle to a power law distribution of income, but because we're talking about a distribution, we're talking about probabilities. So this notation means the probability of finding somebody with income i. If it's a power law distribution, that probability is the inverse of that income raised to some exponent, which we typically call alpha. And alpha has a special meaning. Uh, alpha is the slope of the distribution tail. So this is a very simple formula. Um, and it pops up everywhere. And it pops up everywhere in nature. And it pops up in a lot of places in human society and an income, and we want to know why. Uh, so again, we have, here's the US distribution of income in 1970 and 2007. Uh, just to visualize the power law, it's the slope of this histogram, and um, I've estimated it to be 3.2, and it's changed in 2007 to 2.4. Now, by the slope is negative, um, but by uh, custom, we define alpha to be positive. Uh, so the slope has, has gotten uh, less steep, which means the tail has gotten fatter and alpha decreases. And this is not a new uh, discovery by any means. Uh, it was discovered as far as I know by Vilfredo Pareto in the late um, 
19th century, he discovered that the distribution of wealth and the distribution of income is very skewed and that the tail follows a power law. So sometimes we call power laws Pareto distribution. So this is um, an old finding and it's well known among technical experts on inequality. Um, now we should consider the possibility, having looked at US data, we should consider the possibility that the US is unique. So often what happens in economics is that we look at the United States because it's got the best data and it's a huge country and we we see some trends and then we say okay th this is a general finding well that's a bit of a uh, mistake I think because there are many other countries that could be quite different so we should look at other countries and fortunately that's easy I'm gonna look at every country in the world inequality database now what this database I should say uh, has been around for, in various names, uh, 15 or 20 years, uh, founded in part by Thomas Piketty, and, and, and it's an absolute gold mine for inequality data. So if you are interested in studying income inequality, check out this database. So I pulled all the data from this, the World Inequality Database. Um, there's complete data for about 156 countries, I believe, and I analyzed all of it. And what I'm going to do now is plot the trends. And the way I'm going to do it is by first analyzing the power law exponent in every country among the top 1% of income. So just for reference, that looks like this, right? I'm estimating the slopes of the distributions, although I don't do it with a regression. Uh, and then I'm going to plot that value in the country against the top 1% income share. And if there's some sort of regularity, we should, should see a very uh, clear pattern, which we do. This is the pattern. So each line here, each colored line path is um, the movement through time of a country. And you can see a very clear pattern. It's not perfect. We would never expect it to be perfect. But basically, as, the, as, top, as income inequality increases, top 1% share goes from 2% pretty equal to all, above 50%, extremely unequal, uh, the power law exponent decreases. So that's interesting. Here's a few of the countries labeled. So down here in the low end of inequality, we have um, former Soviet states for the most part. And, and this data is actually it comes from when they were Soviet states. As soon as um, the Soviet regimes were overthrown, inequality increased very rapidly. So these these countries went whoop, up into the middle of, um, of this data. And then over here at the extremes of inequality, we have many African countries, some South American countries, and then the U.S. is in here. So, I mean, the U.S. is right in the middle of the data. Uh, so it's not unique, really. Um, so we have this trend that needs to be explained. And let's, re let's return to this, this idea that the causes of income are admittedly complex, and yet the outcome is quite simple. Why? And I'm going to argue because of hierarchy. And I'm going to try to convince you that this is a pretty good hypothesis. So we're going to dive into hierarchy, and we're going to do it by way of US CEOs. I'm going to look at something called the CEO pay ratio. And this is more famous data, you, you may have seen it. So the CEO pay ratio just takes the pay of CEOs in large US companies and compares it to the average pay of a worker in that sector or in that firm. Um, so let's look at the trend. Looks like this. Uh, Back in 1965, when the data starts, the average CEO in these big companies was earning like 10 or 20 times the, the, the average worker, whereas fast forward to two, the 2000s, and CEOs are earning like two, 300, 350, 350 times the average worker, so a pretty um, explosive increase in CEO pay. And of course, a lot of people have said, well, well, that looks like the timing of uh, inequality increases, and they would be correct. Uh, the CEO pay explosion pretty much corresponds to the rise of U.S. inequality. Here measured, the red line is the top 1% share. Um, 
share of income. Plot it on the right scale. So there's a really strong correlation here, not rocket science. So there's obviously a connection. Uh, but of course, what is the connection? And here, um, surprisingly perhaps, there haven't been a lot of attempts to make formal models that would formally um, relate CEO pay and the CEO pay ratio to the top 1% income share. But I'm going to try to do that for you today. And I'm going to do it using hierarchy. Uh, so to get there, we need to revisit some forgotten history. Way back in 1956, an economist named David Roberts wrote a paper, wrote a paper with a very boring title, A General Theory of Executive Compensation Based on Statistically Tested Propositions. Well, behind this very boring title was some very important um, data that deserves to be famous but has been mostly forgotten. He, Roberts found that CEO pay is very strongly correlated with firm size. So what he's done here, each dot is a CEO and in their, or a, an executive. In each, and on the vertical axis, we've got their income. And on the horizontal axis, we've got the sales of the company. So a measure of the company's size. So a very, very strong correlation. And Roberts tried to explain it. I don't think he had a very good model. Um, but the data stands. The trends still hold today, which I'll show you in a bit. And, but a year later, in 1957, I think we get a good explanation for why this correlation exists, and we got it from Herbert Simon. So in 57, Herbert Simon, who, is, by the way, is a, a bit of a polymath. He made contributions to all areas of science. Um, but in 57, Herbert Simon writes a paper called The Compensation of Executives. Again, a pretty banal title, but the, t the, the content of this paper is, I think, quite incendiary. Simon, uh, Simon uh, start, creates a model of hierarchy. And he says, look, if we have this model, if firms are hierarchically organized, uh, then we're going to automatically have uh, a correlation between firm size and CEO pay. And I'm not going to go through the mathematics of it, but I, I'm going to show you qualitatively how it works because it's very simple. And I'm going to call it the Simon model of hierarchy. Uh, so we start with the hierarchy here. And we assume that income grows with hierarchical rank. It's not a very bold assumption. Um, it's pretty much confirmed by everyday experience. So if income grows with hierarchical rank, as we get to bigger hierarchies, this red person is going to earn more than the red person in the smaller hierarchy, just because they have a higher rank. And we can continue the pattern. This person is going to earn even more because they have a higher rank still. And this. Uh, this red person here, even more still. So as we ramp up the size of the hierarchy, the person at the top is going to earn more just by virtue of them being in a higher rank. Uh, so this is the Simon model of hierarchy, and I think it's impeccable logic. But I'm going to I'm going to take it in slightly a slightly different direction because I think what's most important about hierarchy uh, is subordinates. Right in a hierarchy, you have control over subordinates. That's what the chain of command does. And I think we should focus on this chain of command in any model of hierarchy. So as you move up the hierarchy or move to bigger hierarchies, you're accumulating subordinates. So let's count subordinates. Uh, this red person here has two subordinates. Next, the, the next person has six, 14, 30. So as we ramp up the size of um, the hierarchy, the person at the top is going to have more and more subordinates. They're accumulating subordinates. We can also accumulate subordinates within the same hierarchy. So the person of the bottom of this hierarchy has no subordinates, two subordinates, six subordinates, 14 subordinates, 30 subordinates. So they're accumulating subordinates in the same way. And this control over subordinates is extremely important to hierarchies, and I think extremely important to income, and it's very clearly about power. When you have subordinates, you have power over them. You get to tell them what to do. 
And I'm going to give this power a specific name. I'm going to call it hierarchical power. And I'm going to define it like this. Hierarchical power is the number of subordinates plus one. So the one just signals that you have control over yourself. Uh, so you start with a hierarchical power of one, control over yourself, and then you add hierarchical power as you add subordinates. So I, now let's have a look at how hierarchical power relates to income. So I'm going to plot <clears throat> uh, hierarchical power on the horizontal axis, and it's a log scale going up by powers of 10, and um, relative income on the vertical axis. And I'm going to show you a bunch of data that I've been able to assemble. So we'll start with case study firms. Uh, so these are a variety of firms, and each point actually represents a rank within each of the firms. Uh, so we get, a, we get a pretty strong correlation between hierarchical power and relative income within the hierarchy. Uh, so we can add more institutions. So let's add the US military now in blue points. A slightly different um, slope of the relation, but still a very strong pattern between hierarchical power and income. And we can keep going and add US CEOs, green points. So the CEOs now are, um, each point is an individual. And they, what's interesting is that they extend the trend line. If you draw a line, a regression line through all the data, it looks like this. So the CEOs are kind of extending the trend that we, we find among all the other institutions, which is this very strong correlation between uh, relative income and hierarchical power. Uh, so that's the trend. And we can put it into math form. Um, income is proportional to hierarchical power raised to some exponent d. Uh, so what is d? Well, uh, technically it's just um, the slope of this regression, but um, we can give it a name and we can actually, uh, by giving it a name, give it some social meaning. And I think we should because I think it is socially significant. Uh, I'm going to call D the degree of hierarchical despotism in a hierarchy. So here's what I mean by that. Uh, I'm going to define hierarchical despotism as the degree to which individuals use their hierarchical power to hoard resources. So the idea is that um, hierarchies concentrate power. That's what the chain of command does. And that I guess that power can be good for some things like organizing uh, large groups of people, but it has uh, de definite negative effects, namely despotism, right? It, if you have lots of power, uh, you can use that for to enrich yourself. And, and rulers do all the time. They don't necessarily do it to the same degree. But what I'm saying is that we can actually measure despotism, or at least measure the effects of despotism by looking at how rapidly income grows with hierarchical power. So we're going to plot, we're going to look at the same plot here, hierarchical power versus relative income. Um, and here, just for reference, is the empirical data, the same data that I showed you before. But over top of it, we're going to look at some uh, theoretical trends. So a theoretical trend between income and hierarchical power. Uh, defined by D, the degree of hierarchical despotism. So if D is 0.1, we get a very slow scaling of income with hierarchical power. And we can ramp that up uh, by increasing D. And we get different slopes of lines here, which I've colored differently. And you can see what's important here is that by changing D, we can get um, a very different outcome. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Nothing really changes here, notice. In, the, in low incomes, in low ranks. They all stay the same. All the action is he here at the top of the hierarchy. So if you're in a firm, say, the size of Walmart with a couple million people and you're at the top of that firm, you have millions of subordinates. If hierarchical despotism is low, you're only gonna earn about five times the average per, uh, 
or the bottom ranked worker. But if hierarchical despotism is extreme, you could be earning 10, 100,000 times a bottom ranked worker. So an enormous change here. Uh, so now the question, clearly uh, hierarchical despotism varies between institutions. There's no doubt about that. But perhaps does it vary systematically over time uh, within a country? And I want to explore that possibility. And again, I'm going to return to U.S. CEOs. Uh, let's now look at the same chart, but uh, labeled slightly differently. I'm only looking at CEOs. So on the vertical axis here, we've got the CEO pay ratio. And in the horizontal axis, the CEO's hierarchical power, which is just the, the number of employees in their firm. Uh, here's data in 1992. Uh, so we get some value for D that's interesting. There's a clear correlation between hierarchical power and the CEO pay ratio. Uh, has it changed over time? Well, yeah, in 2007, D was 0.45. So it's gone up from 0.37 to 0.45. Okay, that's interesting. Here's both data plotted together. So we have a very clear shift. Um, but let's continue. I want to know if this is systematic. And it, is it systematically related to inequality, hierarchical despotism and inequality? So let's have a look. So what I'm going to do now in every year that we have data, basically starting in 1992 and up to, I think, 2018 or 2019, we are going to uh, estimate hierarchical despotism among U.S. CEOs. And then I'm going to plot that against the the inequality in the United, the whole of the United States, top 1% income share. Okay? When we do that, we get this pattern. Uh, it is a very, it's a pretty strong correlation. So as hierarchical despotism increases, so does this top 1%, 1% income share. Okay, there's the regression, pretty strong correlation. Uh, so this is I think very interesting. We now have a connection between CEO pay, a systematic connection between CEO pay and plausibly hierarchy and inequality. Uh, but I want to take it a little bit further. I'm going to develop a formal model because I actually want to explain the distribution of top income. So I need to now revisit some more forgotten history about hierarchies and power laws. So there are many mathematical mechanisms for generating power laws. Uh, and hierarchy is actually one of them, or at least the mathematics that seem to occur within hierarchy. Uh, we'll go back to 1959 in a paper published by the economist Harold Liddell. Uh, again, a, another fairly boring title. The paper is called The Distribution of Employment Incomes. But the, the content of this paper is quite incendiary. It Lydell argues that hierarchy can create a power law distribution of income. And I'm going to very briefly go through how the mathematics work. Um, not Lydell's mathematics per se, but just very general how you can create a power law distribution with hierarchy. So in general terms, you can create a power law anytime you merge two exponential functions. So suppose x is an exponential function of t. x is just some variable. And we have another variable y that is also an exponential function of t, but slightly different. What it, when we merge these two functions, meaning we solve for x and y, or we see how x and y are related, we find that x and y are related by a power law. y is equal to x raised to some power, here b divided by a. So this works at any time you merge exponential functions, you're going to get a power law. And Lydell said, look, this is how hierarchy could create a power law. Hierarchy has two exponential functions. The first one, income grows exponentially with rank. Uh, number two, the number of people in a rank decreases exponentially with rank. So, for instance, in the U.S. military, there might be 10, 100,000 um, uh, privates at the bottom of the hierarchy. And, but then at the top, there's only a handful of five-star generals. So there's uh, this exponential decrease in the number of people in, in each rank. So we have our two functions. 
uh, says Lydell, and that's enough to create a power law distribution. And this was back in 1959, two years, by the way, after Herbert Simon wrote his paper, although Lydell doesn't seem to have been aware of Simon's work. So I'm going to use these ideas, the ideas of Herbert Simon and um, Harold Lydell, to make a model of hierarchy. And the, and the big difference in my model is that I'm going to generalize it to many, many hierarchies. So they looked at only one because that makes the mathematics tractable. Uh, but it's not very re realistic. In the real world, there are many, many firms, right? Um, and so we want to have a whole distribution of firms. And that's difficult to do analytically uh, with algebra, but it's very easy to do with a computer model, which I've done. Uh, so let's go into the assumptions of my model. So I assume that firm size is distributed according to a power law. This is just something that I take uh, from the empirical data. For, for whatever reason, firm size has a power law. So we have another power law. Um, the firm, firms are hierarchically organized with a constant span of control. And I'll talk about what the span of control is in a second. And income scales with hierarchical power. So the span of control, well, that's just uh, the number of subordinates that each superior controls. And I assume that it's constant across uh, within firms and across firms. But I can change it over different iterations of the model. So uh, for instance, if the span of control is five, we get a flat hierarchy. Now each subordinate or each superior here controls five subordinates and we get a fairly flat hierarchy. If we increase, uh, sorry, decrease the span of control to two, we get a steeper hierarchy. So in this hierarchy, each superior controls two subordinates. So this change, the span of control changes the shape of the hierarchy, and that, that is important, but it actually turns out not to matter much, too much, um, in my model of income. By far, what matters is this function. This is how I model income. So income is proportional to hierarchical power raised to some exponent d, and d I've given the name, hierarchical despotism, and then I add statistical noise just to make it more realistic because nothing in the social sciences or nature for that matter is perfectly correlated. So we add some statistical noise uh, uh, to uh, make it not a perfect correlation. Okay, so th that's the function and uh, I'm not going to go into the, the mathematics of the model, but I want to show you uh, a visualization of what the model looks like as a landscape. So we start with a size distribution of firms. And I'm going to plot that on a landscape. So each square, a rectangle here, is a firm. We have a lot of small firms and a few very large ones. That's a characteristic feature of a power law. Um, and to these firms, then we're going to add hierarchy. So the hierarchy now moves off the landscape, or up, I should say. It's the, the pyramids here. So we make our pyramids, so now we have firms, a distribution of firms, and they're all hierarchically organized. And then to that, we add income. Uh, specifically, we had hierarchical despotism, which means income grows with rank, or so I should say hierarchical power. So this is what it looks like, for instance, if D is 0.2. So some important features here. At the bottoms of hierarchy, almost everybody's close to um, the median income, which I've defined to be one. And then as you move up the hierarchy, uh, income grows, but you only find large incomes at the tops of the biggest hierarchies. So, but here those incomes are not very large. So we're, we see some green, so some people are earning 10 times. The median income, which is not very high uh, in historical perspective, but we can ramp that up. We can change it by, by increasing despotism. So let's do that now, increase despotism to 0.6, and now we see some much, much larger incomes. We see some blue and purple here, which on our scale is 100, 200 times the average income. And that's all by changing hierarchical despotism. But notice what doesn't change. What doesn't change is at the bottom of the hierarchy, still everybody's earning close to the median income. So that's interesting. Well, let's take this uh, from visualizing it as a landscape and look at the, the, the distribution. So 
hierarchical despotism and the distribution of income. We've got our model in hand and we can see how changing despotism affects the distribution of income. So we'll start with now our familiar log histogram. So we've got income on the horizontal axis the uh, measured uh, on a log scale with the median defined to be 1, 10 to the 0, and we've got income density which is just a way of plotting the number of people on the vertical axis. And so let's show our model, my model. Uh, here's the model when D, hierarchical despotism, is 0.1, so it's very low. There's not much inequality. Most people clump around the median income. And notice that there's no real power law, actually. So that's, that's because in this model, income is mostly generated by my statistical noise. Hierarchy has very little effect on income. But we can change that by ramping up D, ramping up despotism. So let's do that ramp it up to 0.5 and now the rich get richer and they do it like we see in the real world. There's this creeping power law tail. Okay, that's interesting. We can ramp it up again and now we get uh, a creep towards even larger incomes with a long straight tail. Some people are earning millions of times the average income. income. Excuse me. So th this is extreme inequality. But interestingly, notice what doesn't change. Nothing below the median income really changes. So the effect of despotism, hierarchical despotism, are felt among the rich. So we have now a mechanism for making the rich get richer without affecting anything among the lower incomes. Okay, that's really interesting. And just to remind you, this looks an awful lot like what happened in the United States. We started out with uh, one power law tail and then we got another. It shifted. We get a creep towards uh, bigger, bigger incomes, the rich getting richer. Okay, really interesting. So this suggests we're, we're maybe on to something, uh, but hold on. Can we generalize this? Uh, a while ago I showed you the trends across all countries, so I want to return to this data to see if maybe hierarchy has something to say about it. So I'm, I'm going to propose a thought experiment. And in this thought experiment, we are going to let the degree of hierarchical despotism vary over a wide range. Uh, so what I mean by that is in my model, I can pick any value for hierarchical despotism, and I run the model, and I see what happens. And then I can change the value for despotism and run the model again. And I, because it's a computer program, I can do this tens of thousands of times, times and then just see what happens over the range of hierarchical despotism. And what we'll get at the end is some relation between hierarchical despotism and the distribution of income. Well, we don't know what it will be, but we're going to find out. Uh, so returning now to the international data. So to remind you, what I did was in every country, I measured the power law exponent of um, the top 1% of incomes, and I plotted that against the top 1% share of income. So the empirical data looked like this, very clear pattern that we want to explain. So what I'm going to do now is run my model and see what it, what results it produces. So I'm going to show hierarchical despotism in color, and I'm going to let it range from 0 to 1.2, which is a huge range, uh, and then see what happens. And the results look like this. So they plow right through the middle of the empirical data. That's pretty interesting. And notice that all of the shift is happens by changing hierarchical despotism. So each point here is, a, is one model iteration, and the color of it is the degree of hierarchical despotism. So when despotism is like non-existent, we have very little inequality. And in fact, we can't get below this level of inequality or this, uh, because uh, there's, I have a noise function that generates inequality and it's just fixed for simplicity. So we can't get below this point, but we can go way, way up to the extremes of inequality. And we do that by ramping up hierarchical despotism. And as we do, we fatten the power law tail, just as, as seems to happen in the real world. So this is, I think, really, really interesting. Does it prove that, um, Hierarchy is at work here that we're redistributing income through hierarchy. Well, no, first of all, we don't ever prove things in science But second we're, we're talking about a model here 
Uh, so what we can say, though, is that if income was being redistributed through hierarchy, then the pattern would look exactly like what we find. Okay, so that that certainly is interesting, worth researching more. Uh, so just to return to the question where we started, if the causes of income are complex, why is the outcome simple? And I've argued that it's because of hierarchy. Hierarchy, I think we can treat hierarchy as a proximate cause of inequality. We note the patterns that happen in hierarchy. Uh, hierarchy has, a, there's a chain of command, which creates the nest, this nested structure where you accumulate subordinates as you move up the hierarchy. And we know that income grows with control over subordinates. If you assume that, you're automatically going to get a power law distribution of top incomes. And we've known that, surprisingly, since the 1950s, but I've just kind of reiterated it here and shown it in a slightly more sophisticated way. But what I haven't done is really explain why any of the patterns that we see in hierarchy happen. And those deserve an explanation, but I think we can treat them uh, as kind of upstream causes, ultimate causes, if you like, that we don't really understand. So they somehow get filtered. Ideology, politics, class struggle are all filtered through hierarchy. And, and then the outcome is simple. Uh, so now then the question is, um, can we get to these ultimate causes? And I'm not going to I'm not going to really speculate about that in this talk. Uh, but what I think is useful about about um, focusing on hierarchy is that it gives us something to hold on to. If we just want to go from ideology and politics and leap all the way to a power law, we have nothing to hold on to. We have, there's no clear way to get it because ideology and politics, while clearly important for determining income. Um, are messy, right? Whereas hierarchy is very simple. So if we study these ultimate causes through the lens of hierarchy, I think we can. Um, I think we can get somewhere. We can chip away at the problem. So I'll leave you with this picture, this political cartoon, which is about. Uh, it's from the 1830s, and it's about the nullification crisis. It was a constitutional crisis in the United States. Not really a, um, about income at all, but I like this um, poster because it's got despotism at the top, and it looks like a little hierarchy. So we've got despotism at the top of a hierarchy. And in my mind, I, I have really um, learned a lot by thinking in terms of despotism and hierarchy um, having an impact on the distribution of income. All right, so I blog at economics from the top down. So if you're interested in checking out more of these ideas or um, any of my other research, it's going to be there on economics from the top down. All right, thank you.